Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Speculative Speculations. I'm Varsha. I'm Steve. I'm Jared. And I'm Chris. And this is a sci-fi podcast where we talk about sci-fi stories in all their forms. Today we're discussing two short stories by uh, Ted Chang. It's from the collection Stories of Your Life and Others. Uh, the stories we're discussing today are um, Division by Zero and the Tower of Babylon. I'm very curious to hear everyone's thoughts on these. Okay, which one Which one do you want to discuss first? Well, we can start with the Tower of Babylon, I think. Okay. That's the first one, yeah, in, this, in the book, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, what did you all think? You have to go first now, Steve. This is, this is the, you've set this up for yourself. <laughs> I hated it. I did. I don't know if... <laughs> I I just it was a struggle to read. It was a short story, though a struggle to read, and it's I'm, I'm I try I've been trying to to figure out how to explain this because it's not it's not like a Stephen King situation where he explains every little detail, but there's just so many details in this in this story that just have no. I, so I get set in the stage, right? You set the stage, and you want you you do feel the enormity of this tower. You feel the the distance that they're traveling, the weight that they're traveling, all the, the hardships people go through. I get all that, but at some point it's like, okay, let's, let's, let's move on. Like, I get it. Let's do, let's, let's get, let's get it going. Like, let's go. And I, I've noticed too, that in these stories, it kind of feel like we get a lots of setup and lots of things building and lots of uh, environments and a little bit of character. And at the end, there's a gut punch. And that's kind of like it's I kind of feel like we're we're reading along and then kind of expecting for the last page or two to be okay, gotcha at the end. And it's like I'm just okay, like I'm just waiting for the last page. There's times when I'm like, I should just skip to the last page and avoid reading all this stuff because it's like, why are you wasting my time? Like just give me five pages of the story, give me the gut punch and let's move on. Don't give me forty pages and have five pages worth of story on it. And it's, and if there was, if we were developing characters or developing something that had some weight to it or had some kind of like meaningful, something that had something that I can grab onto, I didn't, I couldn't grab onto any, like I, a lot of it was just, like I said, establishing the tower, establishing how, how big it was, how people lived in it, how it was like a, a lifetime thing, but it's just, okay, I, I get it. Like, let's move on. Like, let's get to the story. I don't know. I I'm I'm trying to I was trying not to be too harsh, but it was it was it was tough. <laughs> but maybe, maybe I'm just an idiot. That could be too. Do you think it's a problem just with short friction in general? Because like if you weren't if you really wanted character development, I don't think you're ever really gonna get it out of mm -hmm. most short stories. Um and I think that's a very fair comment like uh, that you've made. That, like it's not exactly uh I'm I'm not not shaking my head going, what are you talking about, Steve? Like I think it's, it's all completely fair. <laughs> Well, I I I, I've, I thought a lot about while I was reading this and in between the stories, I thought about a lot about the paper menagerie mm. and how the similarities or not so many similarities and how in the paper not paper menagerie you have a short story and it feels when you're done with it it feels like a fully fleshed out world and there's characters and there's there are gut punches there are things that you walk away with but you're never bored mm. every Every word is weighty. The story has a really concrete message that it delivers every single time. Like every story in there is a banger. Like every story is fantastic. So I walked away from these stories thinking, wow, Ted Lou or Ken Lou is a genius because of what he did in that collection. It's so good. So I, I appreciate that, that collection even more now. After reading these ones, <laughs> sorry, I'll let I'll let, I'll stop. You guys, go. <laughs> so, so they served the purpose. They made you love other stories. <laughs> yeah. So, Jared, you mentioned earlier when we were talking that you liked one and didn't quite like the other. Was this the one you liked or didn't like? Uh, this was the one I didn't care that much for. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. Like. Uh, it's, it's like Steve said. He, he had. Uh, you had a lot of build up here and I, I kind of see the reason for it. He, um, obviously this is, you know, this is an allusion to the, 
the the, the biblical story, uh, the you know the Tower of Babel, and um, of course in that it's it seems like he was trying to take that concept and make it more concrete into a physical thing that where people were living on it and people you know were taking centuries to build it because it was so huge and so big and and um so you know and that's that's where he gets bogged down in the nitty-gritty about trying to put forth this concept that it's not just a uh a, a mythical magical tower going trying to get to heaven and it's actually something people are building um and i was waiting for something other to happen than than what happened i didn't like how the story ended with this with the metaphysical round trip back to earth and that kind of ruined it for me a little bit i wanted something a little bit more because it didn't answer any questions at all it just said this is a cycle and it's probably just going to keep going on and i i don't like cycle stories like that they don't they don't float my boat cycle cyclic stories like that just don't do it for me that much um i I did think he had a couple of good descriptions and stuff in here there was a couple of good prose points that i liked about a couple of things and maybe maybe i'll read those a little bit later but um that's just my my general perception of this story that uh that bugged me a little bit way and uh to steve's point other writers have done short stories without any of these problems um just look back to robert howard i mean he he was a master his stories are around still for a reason you know but (laughs) chris so, I mean, I, I, I'm quite surprised. I actually thought of the two stories that if people liked one, didn't like the other one. I thought that I liked the Tower of Babylon because it's more of a tale. Now, the other story, I think, is more, there is, there is more character work in the other one. So maybe that's where the, the difference comes in for sure. But I was trying to think from a narrative point of view why you would write the story like this because you're right. It is very dry. It is almost written in like a biblical sense, you know, almost like a biblical text of basically telling the events that happened and nothing else. You know, that is kind of the you only know, beaten bones and to the points that have been made like it does feel like even in the first two stories we've done of this there is a bit of a formula to mm-hmm. the story that is writing in so far as he tells a bit of a setup and then he leaves you with an open-ended sort of idea to pose at the end for you to take away and and, and ruminate on which i think you know in some ways he, he does succeed at what you take away from that might be different from person to person so there's two things narratively that i thought he was trying to achieve Uh, The first one was that this whole setup and this quite long, dry, if you want to say, kind of setup that that he has is him trying to approximate what it was like building the tower. As we were reading along, pretty much you both described the feeling of, I need to know what's at the top of this tower. I I, I need there to be some payoff at the top of the tower. I need there to be something happens at the top of the tower. Come on, hit me with it. Make something happen. And when something doesn't happen, just like the people, you're left with that disappointment to think now that's a hell of a risk to taking storytelling <laughs> because you're supposed to be telling entertaining stories or otherwise. But it then comes down to the idea of I think he's setting up that these people are trying to think that the thing at the top of the top is divine, but actually the world is governed by science, and actually the actual result is scientific reasoning rather than thing, which is often disappointing because one incurs faith. And the other one incurs, you know, belief and see um, um, what you see around you. So I think it's more of a, a tale in divinity versus science, or that's certainly that's that I what I took away from it. Hmm. Yeah, it, is it divinity versus science, or is it uh, contentment versus an urge to curiosity? Maybe because mm-hmm. you, if you looked at all those people, he would count it on the way up. Hmm. Um, they were very content in what they were doing in those, you know, the little cities that were made on, in, on the tower all the way up. They weren't, they weren't continuing to go. It was only hmm. certain people who were going on and s- chopping away at the sky or whatever. Um, so uh, those, yeah, he does raise those kind of questions with some of his, his, uh, his points, you know? Hmm. Yeah. I think the humans, humans and our desire to, to explore and to find answers and to build and to expand and 
um, yeah, I kind of, I, I got a lot of that too from this one. Yeah, and, it, and there was also a difference between the Bible and this, the contrast to the Bible, whereas in the Bible, you know, it's a very act of God that strikes down humanity and gives them all the different languages as a kind of a punishment, uh, whereas this is a hands-off Nope, you guys are just going on a cycle all on your own. You know, you're building this tower for nothing, and you you're coming up, and you're back to earth, and you're probably going to do it again. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, a very hands off type of uh, you know metaphysical attitude. Steve, you made the comparison to Stephen King. I, for spoiler reasons, that is so incredibly apt <laughs> to this story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm, but anyway, without spoiling other stories for, for our listeners, I I kind of agree with everything you guys all said. Um, I did. I, I think this was one of those stories where I liked the parts without really enjoying the whole. Um, there were some bits in the middle that uh, I think where our character, um, what's his name? I don't even remember his name. Um, where our character meets some people who live in the tower and they talk about how they're never going back to the city. And that that felt very resonant of, say, immigrant experience, that why mm. I have a good life here, why would I mm. go back? Or you have nothing to go back to. And that whole section felt very much like it was, I don't know if it was intentional, but I read into that a lot about what immigration uh immigrant experience might be like and then there's the other one that was another section uh where he talks about the the fact that he felt like he was neither going up nor going down somewhere in the middle that again i think um i felt this on a much smaller scale uh myself but you know growing up i grew up in a place that spoke a different language than my mother tongue and there were times when i felt accepting of both but or being accepted by both and other times where i felt like i belonged neither place and this felt like it was commentary on that too a little bit um but yeah oh and i really loved the whole uh exploring the scientific aspect of like what the tower looks like, how the light moves across the tower and so on and so forth. But ultimately, like Steve said, like this is not a story that I will say, oh, this was brilliant. I'm, I love everything about it. This, I, I think Ken Liu did a fantastic job of giving us characters that we love along with the story. I, I think I can discuss Chang's ideas for hours, <laughs> but there's mm -hmm. not much memorable about his characters. Even in the last one, for instance, uh, the movie made the characters real for me. I don't think the story, if I'd met the story <laughs> without the movie, probably wouldn't have gotten attached to anyone, really. Yeah, it's a couple, a couple of things. I, I think the people in I think these stories are about people a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. They are very much about the interactions of people with each other and about family and, and, and about a sense of culture. Whereas these are like very much more classic sci-fi, I think, in their ideas of trying to communicate kind of bigger ideas in smaller ways or otherwise. There were a couple of lovely bits. The bit with the the viewing of the sun setting and that yeah. kind of, even as a, as a guy who was just building the wall, how he was awed by the yeah. power of nature and actually how much he understood by just observing it from a different angle. I thought that was a really powerful uh, piece of writing uh, within, yeah, yeah. within the story and then also at the end when he comes and he realizes that you know the way the world is structured upside down he is worried about the effect of when he goes to tell people actually what happened one is he going to be believed and two mm -hmm. you know what that actually means for the future of their civilization because their whole civilization has been you know looking just to build this tower up the sky to create a path to the heavens to ascend essentially mm -hmm. and if by ascending and doing all that time of work they find that it was for nothing then mm. what does that mean for that that civilization? Where is the drive? Where is the thing? And the people who were happy just living on the levels of the tower, if the tower isn't there anymore, the tower has no purpose. What does what does that mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. It did it feel like in parts they weren't really talking about the tower at all. Like it could just be another place 
on the planet and it would be just the same like the section in between where it was completely um unpopulated because the sun shines so hot in that part of the tower that nobody can live there <laughs> that that felt like just describing a desert it it was yeah it, it just felt like a very exploratory story and yeah to to your point chris about how it ends whether whether civilization can still find meaning or purpose in all of this the other way <laughs> that i could look at it that i started to think about it, but this wasn't the point from the author's notes uh, but as it may, is the world like donut shaped or something do they build a tower from one into the other but yeah interesting weather phenomenon i suppose that that we could explore but yeah yeah i, I didn't think he explained that that well either because i really had a hard time picturing how he ended up back on the earth in a scientific manner i mean if it's mm. if it's all mystical mumbo jumbo then fine he's back on earth but if he was applying any kind of um you know uh logic to the to the building and to the uh to the uh the you know the shape of the universe here i had a hard time picturing it so i wasn't sure what he was trying to describe Hmm. I don't they, know if anybody else had that problem. Or... Oh yeah, so they they did reference it. They did. I think the, towards the beginning they talk about falling off the edge of the Earth. So I kind of felt like okay, they thought the Earth was flat. But and then at the end, I thought, is it a cylinder or what? What shape? He mentioned a cylinder, but but I still couldn't picture yeah. how the tower fits into the cylinder. I, I couldn't quite or, picture it. Or do they go through like the center of the Earth? I don't. I don't know. I I was like, what? <laughs> What's going on? I was hoping you guys knew because I was like, maybe I'm just an idiot, which is usually what happens. So I was hoping one of you would know. I I just thought it was a vague allegory for the fact that the world was round, um, and and that it's go round, so it's kind of go to the top, but kind of comes around the bottom, and that the whole thing, the Earth was just at the top, the top and the bottom set sort of join. So if you go up high enough, you've just went the whole way around the circle or around the cylinder, so to speak. Hmm. So, but we think we're going up, but we're actually just going round. I mean, this is good oh, audio because I'm using, I'm, I'm using my fingers. Um, <laughs> but uh, you're traveling around a circle rather than just we think we're going up, which is essentially the same thing as happens on Earth now because we think we are just going left, but again, we're just going round round a sphere. Right. Yeah. When you're traveling across the ocean, you're actually mm -hmm. going around a sphere. You're not just yeah. going straight across. You're not going straight across. Maybe. Lines, yeah. 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 <laughs> but it, 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 it's not easy to visualize for sure. I, I sort of went, well, what, is, what, what does that look like? Same, same, same as you. And it is that kind of uh, thing. And, and to that point, I think in some of his his points that he's trying to make or whatever, there is a sort of expectation that you will be able to understand at the end that I don't, it is not completely lay in the same way that, say, Paper Menagerie, which, which, which are very much more fancy based stories for the most part. There are some sci fi stories certainly in there, but there is, and I think especially in the next story, there is a kind of if you don't understand or have not done enough, enough maths, you're just going to sit there and go, okay, let's skip on the next bit because I'm not. <laughs> It's not actually really important at the end of the day, much like this, how this world works at the end. It's not totally important that you visualize, but it leaves it unsatisfying, you know, the, the, when you when you go to read uh, and that you have to stop down and think out and then get a piece of paper and kind of draw it out for yourself or something. You know, that's not exactly uh, um, a satisfying feeling of reading the story. Yeah. And yeah. There, there's one line in here that actually kind of reflects what we're saying here because he says when he's looking at the visible length of the tower, and he's saying to look up and down is frightening. And he says, mm. the reassurance of continuity was gone. And that kind of echoes how I feel about this story. I don't have any reassurance of continuity about this story. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, I, I did also rack my brain quite a bit about the shape. I mean, I... I concluded at the end that it must be some sort of weird folding in on itself thing, but I couldn't figure out how to make the cylinder work because you kind of have to start on the inside of the cylinder, get to the top and then dig your way through to the other side. But now you, how are you close enough 
that you're able to walk back to your starting point, which is on the inside, right? Anyway. And plus, how much of a bummer would that be to go through all of that and then you come back, you look at the bottom. Oh, again. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. It's a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was there, was there, but, um, yeah, go ahead. But go ahead. he he did actually speculate actually as he was near the top that actually actually was what was going to happen. But I that actually highlighted the part part from page twenty one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when he looked at the vault, he felt as if the world had flipped around somehow, and if he lost his footing, he would fall upwards to meet it. Oh, and um, so that before they even started building the ramp and kind of taking trying to break through the kind of seamless vault, he kind of felt that the higher that he got, the more that he. he the world had turned upside down on himself and like it, the ground was his ceiling which at the time i think sort of was more about his status of mind as he ascended the tower and kind of seen where home was or, or land was but it also actually was true in terms of you know what what was actually happening in the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there there were parts that i i don't have it highlighted i don't think but it started to make me feel like that's just another part of earth like they're going to they're going to dig their way out. I didn't think it would be like full circle, but it felt like they weren't going to, they're, they're not going to meet Yahweh. They're just going to dig themselves out to another part of the, of the planet. Mm. But, um, but yeah. So what did any, everyone think of division by zero? For those of you not watching, I'm giving a, I'm face palming, face palming. <laughs> okay, I, I'll actually start with this one because for those that uh, that, that don't know, I'll give some background. I teach maths for a living, so actually reading through this, I was kind of like, right, I, I understand an awful lot of what he's talking about here. This is not the maths part of it. I actually do understand. I don't actually see why it's entirely relevant to actually lay a lot of this out as part of the story. Uh, because I don't see unless you unless you have a deep connection with maths or have experienced that moment where you kind of accept that maths all makes sense, whether the story makes any sense to you otherwise. Mm. I don't see how that connects, how you connect with that story in that sense. So actually the need for explaining why division by zero and the one equal two problem that a lot of people who, who have been in around maths that's have, have sort of all seen at a certain point, Euler's formula of all, of all seen, that's great. But if you knew that, you knew that going in. You know, you didn't need to lay it out in the page uh, for yourself. So I that I was very curious reading that going. Like, from my background, this is not so bad. Still sort of unsatisfying, but again, I think that's the point of it because that's the point that our central character is going through insofar as, well, if this doesn't make any sense, what's the point of my life kind of thing? Like, well, the natural structure and order is gone now. But if you're not even on that train, like, what are you getting out of the story? So I was curious. I I'd like to hear from Jared and Steve because I got most of the math too. I'm I'm a computer science student, so yeah, I I, I studied com girdles and completeness theorem in school, so this wasn't uh, the math wasn't new to me. So yeah, I'd like to hear from you. But go ahead, Jared. You can start with this one. Ah, well, I um. I'm not a math teacher, but I play one on TV. No, I'm just uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, no, I I thought the math itself, from for my part, uh, was kind of irrelevant, mm -hmm. except for how he described, and I kind of got a, um, a a little minor theme for each number as each you know cha little chapter number as. Uh, he was going through it and it, it like the, uh, the first one was, um, I attributed it to, to numbness hmm. as he mentions, as he mentions the, uh, you know, accompanying sensation was one of numbness sheer tedious wrote when, because that, and that was related to the first math problem. And then the second one, I got duty out of it. it you know, it's the duty of the math to do what it does. And then the third one, I got love, and it, and it's kind of all implicit in the descriptions that he's giving to those problems. And you know, I I, I couldn't really nail down every single one. I have a theory for each one, and I thought the fourth one was consistency, and the fifth one I had lack of proof, and the sixth one I had contradiction, 
and then the seventh one I had doubt, and the eighth one I had truth, and then the ninth one I had reality. And so that's what I got out of the descriptions of the math problems and how it related to her situation in dealing with her crisis here. Um, and I also got a greater theme out of the whole story that empathy isn't always a good thing uh, in her case, especially. And so that's, I thought it was just a thematic little piece. That's all it was uh, for, for me. And I, that's what I was grasping out of it as I was going along and not, you know, cause I, the math was like, okay, math. Yeah. And I was just grasping it. I was grasping at the descriptions of the math in relation to her situation and how she was feeling as going throughout her, the little history he explained there. So, whew, that was it. That was it. That's what I, <laughs> I, I just want to say how cool it is that the themes, the, those themes you came up like they feel so apt. <laughs> I love that you added a theme, especially the last one about reality and truth. Those were brilliant. <laughs> but oh, thank you. <laughs> the what um, I, I kind of felt like the stuff in between was added to build a case for people who may not like it wasn't really expecting I, I got the impression that I wasn't expecting you to know the math beforehand but more that it's explaining this bit of math so you can understand eventually when you get to the end why she's as frustrated as she is or what happened to her but I don't know if it laid the groundwork sufficiently <laughs> to give that impression. But yeah, maybe Steve, what do you what do you think? Did it succeed? <laughs> so again, I'm an idiot. Uh, math and numbers and I have a complicated relationship that uh, it is not a healthy relationship. Um, I've never been good at math. I've I know just enough math just because of my profession that just to get by. I've learned more than I ever thought I could learn with math just because I had to. And I hated every minute of it. Um, so I'm not a math person. I'm not a numbers person. Just, just don't, we just don't get along. We just, so in this story, I was completely lost. I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea what these numbers or what these equations or I had no idea what the point of the story was. I was completely lost and I tried to go back and, and make sense of it. I tried to, okay, the, the last, again, the last page about disproving the existence of God. And I thought there was something that, what did I miss? Like, what am I not getting? So I went back and I read it again and I still didn't understand. Like, I, it just didn't make any sense. It made zero sense to me. I was completely lost. Again, I'm an idiot. So <laughs> that's, that's, I was lost. I got, I, the only thing I walk away with this one is just confusion. And like, so. Hmm. I, I would say my wife would read it, right? My wife has got what would be a full qualification of the obtain of maths. And she would walk away from most of the story, I think, with a similar... This is this is a game that I, I felt... Even certain parts of it, I was like, hold on. What is he trying to say here? A, a, a lot of the times, even I was I was doing a lot of that, uh, especially with the stuff like... Why even mention Euler's formula and stuff like that? Other than to have it like, as a reference, it's almost like when you are playing fan service to, you know, to something that's come beforehand that they have to say, right, I'm going to write a story about maths and here's a couple of notable things that I'm going to drop in here so that people who like math uh, will be able to go, oh, I know that, that, that that's good. But it, I don't really see that it served a purpose in the story in, in, a, in any real way uh, other than like even the division by zero setting it up. The only reason he, he used to do that narratively was so that the partner, could, Carl, could turn around and say, oh, that's just what that problem is. And like literally, that was one. And she says, "No, it isn't. It's not like that at all." But that was that was the only purpose that, that it served. So, hmm. again, if you read the story notes at the back, which I thought were quite interesting for Division by Zero, in terms, it was very much what do you do if something that you believe in absolutely you have not only just found to be possibly untrue. What if you've proven that it's untrue? What does that mean for you as a person? What what does that do to your shake your foundations? as to what it's doing. And while that was the intent of doing it, he wrapped it up in such a bubble of techno bubble in an awful last sense. Like, can you imagine if that was a TV episode of a Star Trek episode? People people go, what, what, what? Like that, that didn't make any sense. Yeah. 
if if we took away all the math interludes, do you think that the rest of the story, I think the rest of the story could work on its own, yeah. right? Because in the end, if if you took the math stuff out, in yeah, in in the end, it's just about the fact that sh the foundation of her life has been shaken, right? And the foundation of the science of the world has been shaken, but I feel like that could be a different story, but yeah. yeah. It, it mm -hmm. reminded me of um, that movie, A Beautiful Mind mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Russell Crowe when he, when he goes John nuts. Knight. Yeah, yeah, when he goes nuts uh, with all the numbers and stuff like that and uh how she she was having a really hard time with with um the things she discovered you know? I, I think there is some quite interesting ideas for her as a character and personally because not that i know what this feels like but can you imagine right growing up being like a math genius to the point that she even alludes to the fact that even when it's surrounded by other math geniuses people look at her and go oh she's in another level right and she's based her whole career, her whole reputation, everything her value system is based on the fact that she's the best person she knows in the world at math and understanding problems and trying to create problems to solve, which is one of the things Carter throws her. And that not only that she finds a problem with it, but she's the person that ruined it. She's <laughs> the individual that actually ruined yeah. it. And she actually basically alludes to the fact that everybody else is too dumb to even understand that this is a problem. They'll just write it off as just one of those things. But mm. I have ruined the one thing that I held most cherished, most dear, and most true. It was the center all the time, and I destroyed it. And I can't continue on with life in that scenario. And I think that that exploration of that that personal side is actually quite interesting. Unfortunately, it only lasts for about a page and a half. But maybe the setup of that kind of was needed to get to that point. I'm not sure. Yeah, to me, what it felt like is you you know when you when you go to like a, a gathering and there's like groups of friends that have their inside jokes and like, remember the time? Oh yeah. That, remember, that's the way I felt like, what are you guys talking about? Like, what is going on? I don't know what happened that night at the club or what night at the bar, the yeah. night that, you know, whatever. It was kind of like, I felt like, okay, there, there's a, there's a joke here that I'm missing. Like you had to be there. You had to be there. <laughs> had to be there. <laughs> so. Lots of math, lots of math fans are like waving their fists in the air listening to this. Like you, idiot. <laughs> and to be fair, maybe this is something I, I put Devarsha then or anybody else. The whole idea that uh, dividing by zero is undefined is one of those things in maths that even for people that love maths feels unsatisfactory. It is a satisfactory right answer to a problem, but it also feels incomplete in its own right. right. Uh, in terms, uh, in terms, and I thought that's the direction the story was going to go, given the title of the story and all that kind of stuff is that you know the problem with the, the undefined is that it doesn't really answer the question it just kind of says oh put a line through that question the person who wrote it was wrong you know <laughs> yeah he didn't know what they were talking about kind of thing so you know uh, uh, is what it feels but yeah so yeah it it feels that i like okay sorry what i thought <laughs> Never mind. What was I going to say? Yeah, I thought it'd be more of an exploration of that by division by zero. But uh, do you think that? Do you agree with the reaction to this? So, I don't. I don't know a lot about. I, I don't know a lot of the math for physics. I just know very basic stuff. But there's this big hole that we need to fix, right? This whole reconciliation between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, and a lot of that has its foundation built on math if someone came along and said hey the basis on which we've built all of this is wrong that might actually be something to celebrate in my opinion because now you go back to the drawing board and figure something out that could work and bring everything together <laughs> and make it all work but um but this and and i don't also necessarily agree that it's not what she discovered is not like when quantum physics, I mean, yeah, I guess it's different, but also it's similar in that now it's back to the drawing board. You have to go readjust many things. So it- But at her point though, Varsha, it's not that Euclidean geometry or whatever is broken. It's the fact that classic basic arithmetic is broken mm -hmm. is, is, yeah. is her thing. Like if we, if the most basic concepts that we have 
don't work, then actually we know nothing. Like yeah. we, the, all this other stuff that we built off this general idea is gone. And uh, and again, I sort of like that idea, but I also I have <laughs> trouble with accepting that that can ever possibly be a thing because yeah. you know I don't I don't see how you linear proof. Anyway, that's that's extension yeah. of disbelief, you know. <laughs> There's, there was, I, I was watching a Veritasium video recently, I think in which I, th he was talking about, was it Euler or Euclid's postulates? Uh, yeah, yeah. They haven't been fully proven yet. Um, but anyway, this, this felt like if someone proved that they, they don't work. <laughs> so I did actually like, there was some discussion in it that is very true insofar as there are some basic things about maths that we know to be true, but we can't prove. Right, mm. they actually said that in the middle of the book a couple of times. So there's there's the classic single problem that every every number that we can ever think of can be add, made by just adding three prime numbers together. That's mm. it. They know that's true, can't prove it, can't prove it, and they sort of feel like only in the event of proving it will we ever get a, a, a satisfaction and be able to make advances. It's kind of these idea that these problems unlock the future uh, for an awful lot of understanding. So I'll, I did like that exploration of it. And I have to say, in general, I like I like these stories because they do require some sort of specialist knowledge. And I'm sure I'll get to another story in this thing that will be somewhere in the realm of chemistry or <laughs> physics. And I will be as, as lost as anybody in, in, that, in that realm. But I do like the idea that there is a story from either if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, there's a story that I can make sense. Even though I can sort of accept that it's not a great story, it mm -hmm. has problems, but it is also exploring parts of of my brain that, that don't normally come up. And one of my biggest frustrations in sci-fi is when they try and use, for hard sci-fi reasons, really hard science, and then just fudge it at the end. Like, get halfway yeah. through and go, yes, but we're going to just make a magic button that does everything at the end and they, they mm. create a word that's all hard sci-fi it's all going to be done by this and then they go here's a MacGuffin though that makes the final bit work and you go you can't do that yeah. like that's that's not yeah, that's not the world that you created here I'm here's not mentioning the bit like yeah. anyway. <laughs> the button what about the, the button? button? What about the button? What about the hatch? The hatch and the button. Exactly, exactly <laughs> that point. Dude. We always come full circle. Oh, this oh it always goes out to last. Damn it. <laughs> I thought those terms sounded familiar. Yeah, the hatch and the button. <laughs> so um, I wonder if it's possible to read around the signs that we don't get. Like, like mm. you said, chemistry might be completely out uh, for me. And in the last story, for instance, linguistics over my head yeah. but i still got something out of that story so i wonder if this particular one i wonder if he made it needlessly difficult with the math interludes because the parts i i feel like maybe with some mild tweaking the parts without the math might work on its own to get the same point across yeah. like her the ground beneath her feet was shaken okay that um but yeah, the math parts were fun to read for all that's it. <laughs> um, the, I, I read the story notes at the end of the book. And this one apparently started from the idea that um, I mean, he wondered. The, he found the proof first, was shown the proof for, for Euler's formula. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and they thought it was so beautiful and i could see where it was going right before the end but just again the reasons that anybody who loves maths does love maths they've all been in the room when that happened um so and that's what i'm saying i could relate to certain parts of that for sure mm -hmm. yeah yeah it yeah it's a cool idea and i kind of like i it's educative for me in the sense that at some point when i write stories i want to explore I, concepts like this and mm -hmm. I, I guess we need more character work or like more things to use to latch on to characters and stuff. But but I like the exploration that the story and the other one did too. Like just take some sort of, it's a kind of like a what if exploration, right? Like what if we built a tower into the sky mm -hmm. and regardless of the ending, just a tower that's 22 miles long, what would living in that be like? Or in this one, what if someone found out that everything that we've based everything on the world doesn't stop working but your <laughs> your truth has shaken to its core uh what would that be like so that 
yeah, I think I think it's is that what classic sci-fi used to do? I, I know that's kind of what it used to do in short stories, but I don't know if if it gave us characters to latch on to and things like that. Like out of the six, what six SF masterworks that we've read so far, I feel like at least two or three of them didn't do a good job with the story elements of it. They did a good job of the idea exploration aspect, but yeah, I mean, I like these a lot better than having that one idea, like in Cities of Flights, mm. and oh, just going off and not doing anything besides yeah. <laughs> whatever he did there. <laughs> and uh, uh, so these these um, these are so short that uh, it, they're not painful, you know, um, to get through because uh, you're over. It's over before you know it. Um, and, and a lot of short stories um, generally always have that little something missing because they're focused on one aspect of a theme. Hmm. And so that, you know, there is a lot of them that come up a little short in other areas that you might be looking for. And, uh, you know, so because I've read a lot of short stories um, in uh in contemporary literature hmm. and um like you know and some of them some of them are masterpieces and some of them some of them uh, leave you with this idea the sense that yeah they got their idea across but there's something else lacking about it but that wasn't the point of the short story the point was to get that idea across yeah. and i think that's what he's doing in both these cases uh, I'm not sold on the idea of the the Tower of Babylon. <laughs> I didn't think that was a very good one in my, you know, my opinion. That's all. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought the Division by Zero was pretty cool as far as because mm -hmm. uh, I because I I kind of because I latched onto those themes he was working with and mm -hmm. I kind of uh, enjoyed that part of it. As, as someone who a self-proclaimed idiot, like I've <laughs> mentioned a couple times, I think if if you're writing this story that you is a basically like a love letter to math, people who aren't mm -hmm. familiar with math, like I'm not, if you would have put a little bit more into the characters and just a, just a little bit more, just enough for me just to flesh them out because they're just <clears throat> names on a page; they weren't characters to me, so I couldn't latch on to anything because I didn't know what the, the what was going on with them. No yeah. math. And I I just didn't follow at all so I, if i had a little bit to a little bit to sing by teeth, teeth into it the characters then it would have made it i would have had something to wrap my arms around mm. Yeah. Mm. and it's interesting because in the story of my life he used the allegory of parenting mm. to do that you know to explain some of the linguistic linguistical problems so he could it could attack you and inform you on two levels uh, and and this one it, it just seemed like uh no this is this is for me essentially i don't even think he's writing for people i think it was it was for him mm. is, is is what the story was he wanted to write something similar to what he'd been shown or what he knew hmm. it it did feel somewhat structurally similar to stories of your life a uh, story of your life with the, with the technical stuff in interleaved with the with what's happening with the characters but again, I, I think, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Steve that the characters weren't particularly compelling for me or even that likable for that matter. Maybe what's, her, what's his name? Carl <laughs> was okay, but the other one seemed not very likable. But I feel like that's just maybe because there wasn't much work put into that character, into building for, for all I know, she's a perfectly pleasant person <laughs> who just doesn't look good <laughs> on the page. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. The, yeah, the character work, it's interesting because I do think he was trying to make a point about the characters because they both have breakdowns. They both kind of were there for each other at a certain point and all of that kind of stuff. And yet, it didn't seem important other than, you know, she wanted sympathy rather than empathy. She wanted him to bug him and leave him alone, but it just made her come across as a horrible person, <laughs> self centered mm. person like that's realistically all of that it came through as it wasn't a criticism of him, yeah. it was a criticism of, of, of her and her inability. And even what she says at the end, you know, where she thanks and appreciates him, and the relationship sort of falls apart, and then that's the end of the story. Mm. And it's like, okay, 
Yeah. I wasn't that uh, of all three stories read, that's the one that I kind of came away at the end and went, I don't know what I'm supposed to be thinking about <laughs> at the end yeah. of this rather than um on some of the other ones. Yeah. Did, what did you think of his rationalization at the end about how it's okay to to leave? It's not very nice, but it's not wrong to leave her right now. What <laughs> I, I I I didn't know what to make of that. I don't know. I think it would depend on um, what the plan was going forward, uh, because um, it, like he wasn't able to help her. Mm. You know, I think that's her thinking. Mm. He, there's nothing he can do. Mm. He's he's uh, he's already tried everything he could to help her, and um, and she didn't need that type of help. So. Was he leaving so that she could get better help, or was, or was he just leaving? Uh, mm. You would think he seemed like a nice guy throughout the story, you know, but so you would think he that it would lead to getting some other kind of help for her, and not not him, because he wasn't helping the situation mm. uh, with, you know, that he lacked the skills to do to do what he you know to help her out. That's that's the kind of the way I took it, but um, mm. he he did leave it. He did leave it open enough that you for your own interpretation as far as that goes. Hmm. I kind of took it as as it's a um what I think is void of emotion, almost like math is, almost like it is what hmm. it is. Is kind of the way I took it. Like it is um it's um it just makes sense. Like there's no emotion in it. It's just like but it's just numbers with math, so it's hmm. it's just the way he saw it i guess it's kind of the way i took it but hmm. i like that interpretation the the ending being yeah like math <laughs> hmm. jared you said something about um how empathy is not always a good thing i think that was you right yeah um, yeah yep um he mentioned that in the in the story that was part of um What's it? What's it? What's his name? Carl? Is it? Mm -hmm. Carl is, is the middle character. Yeah. Uh, now I can't find it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, but he mentioned something that uh, about that at the at the end of the uh, of the story. Yeah, division by zero. Here we go. And he um. And and it came up with uh. It came up that um he was feeling very empathetic to her uh yes and it was that's the, actually the last lines for this for this was an empathy that separated rather than united them you know because he was trying to say i know how i can feel how you feel i uh, i know exactly what she means and he felt the same things as she but he had to stop himself because it was that empathy that him feeling what she was feeling was actually causing separation to mm. those things. And that's, and that was like the last two lines of the whole story. And, um, that is a common, um, uh, uh, element to a lot of short stories is actually to state the theme right in that either the final, couple of yeah. sentences or maybe in the first two sentences of the whole story that that happens a lot yeah. um, in a lot of a lot of contemporary literature short stories and uh he did that right there and that's why that's why I, that stood out to me interesting yeah i like that it so one question i have about reading the story notes at the end i tend to take that as the main thing that he's exploring but it's always so far, it's always been about the scientific aspect of the story. Do you think that there is some uh, people themes or human themes also that he's exploring through each one? Um, and I guess we talked about that a little bit now with what Jared said about empathy, but the other two stories, um, what did you guys think about the non-scientific themes there? I, 
the non part of the short stories lies in science. I, I I don't think without I think without the science, there's not an awful lot to grab onto. Like I say, this is this, these stories aren't about the characters, regardless of how the last story en ends up. I think even in the terms of story of my life, which we did last week, we had a mother, daughter, father. Mm. We barely knew any of them. In fact, the, the father yeah. is only present in one part of the timeline, as, as it is in the book, or otherwise the child is a brat for a lot of it, you know, <laughs> uh, as it goes through stage of life. There's no there's no attempt to empathize or create characters that you like in any of these stories. Like even our person carrying up, walking up the, the tower, in most cases, we would be made to care whether they fell and died off the tower. Mm -hmm. like, but I don't think if we got the end of the story and it was like, he fell off the top of the tower, spat and ended up in like broken bones at the bottom of the went, Okay, <laughs> I think that had pretty much the same effect as uh, walking, going through the top of the tower and coming out the bottom. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, there, so there's, he doesn't, his purpose is not to create um, empathy in it, in the stories and mm -hmm. in, in the reader. Here, it's more to prompt ideas and and kind of do that in a very classical sci-fi sense. And before we started this, I I knew that this collection of stories and this later one are very divisive. Some people say it's the greatest thing ever, and other people are like, "Oh no, this wasn't for me. I had to stop reading, whatever." And that's to get that kind of stuff is unusual. You know, the, the very two opposite polar, but it, it makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense now. Now that yeah. I'm reading it. Any other ideas or thoughts to bring up before we wrap it up? Good. <laughs> All good. <laughs> All good. Cool. Um, if, you, if you're following along on the podcast with us next week, we're going to be talking about Nightfall uh, by Isaac Asimov. It's available in a collection called Nightfall and Other Short Stories. And you may also be able to find it online in some form or the other. Uh, the other short story we'll be reading is The Evolution of Human Science, which is five pages long and from the collection by Ted Chiang called Stories of Your Life and Others. So we're continuing on with this collection, but also drawing in one more short story from a different one. Uh, if you'd like to join us for any of these discussions or discuss the stories with us on the forum, please consider checking out the Patreon forum. We'll see you in a week. Thank you so much for listening.